Uh, what a blessing it is to be out here again. This is my fourth time out here preaching on a Sunday morning. And, um, you know, I was talking to my wife this morning. I'm like, I wonder when, you know, at what point are we just members, right? At what point do we get the card in the mail that says that, you know, from J-Dub, that says that, hey, man, you guys are, are, are family and I got to start sending my tithe here. Um, but uh, this is such a blessing. <clears throat> my time is short. And um, how, how many glad that the, uh, the election is over? All right, that's probably the best, uh, the best honk of the, uh, of the morning so far. Uh, I am so glad that it's over, uh, but we know that the work is not done. Um, how many, so <clears throat> I know we've got a different mix of age groups in here, but I know many of you have taught your children about King Solomon. And uh, that's kind of where I'm gonna be focusing this morning. And the, the title of my message um, even though we're, you know, I'm going to spare you some of the political dialogue and, uh, and all of that narrative, um, I do want to talk about divine wisdom to govern. Divine wisdom to govern. Because in America, we are all governors. We are all uh, uh, part, you know, active in the making of laws and, and the shaping of society in our country. But I want to start out in 1 Kings uh, with King Solomon. Solomon ruled for uh, Israel for 40 years, and that's pretty impressive. He, he, uh, there was no more prosperous time in Israel than when King Solomon uh, was um, in, during his reign. Even more, he took over for his father, King David, um, and, uh, and it was even more prosperous, uh, a nation under, under Solomon's reign. Um, the thing, though, that a lot of folks don't realize about King Solomon um, is that he took over uh, the reign from his father at the age of 20. Now, I don't know about you, but um, that can be pretty intimidating when you are the successor to the greatest king of Israel. Uh, uh, they said King David was. And because of that, he went to God in prayer. And that's where we pick up in, our, in our, uh, uh, 1 King 3. Uh, and we'll start in probably verse 5 around there. Feeling overwhelmed, Solomon went to God in worship and God appeared to Solomon in a dream saying, ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, O oh Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father, David. Although I am only a little child, I do not know how to go out or to come in. Anybody ever felt like God, I don't know if I'm coming or going. Right. Like, I, you know, for some of us, it's, it's trying to manage a family. For some of us, it's maybe a new job. For, for some of us, maybe it's a role in the church that the pastor is and, and the Lord maybe is, is calling you to that you feel inept or, or ill-equipped to feel. And you turn to God and say, Lord, I don't even know if I'm coming or going. You know, maybe maybe you're not 20 years old, but you don't have to be 20 years old to feel inept and inadequate. Amen. And that's where he was. And that's exactly where he was. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Let's see what he says. So give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind. Now, we all know that Solomon was the wisest person that ever lived. And we all know from where that wisdom came from. But why? Why was he the wisest person that ever lived? Why did God see fit to grant him with that double portion of wisdom and understanding? See, if you're a business owner in here, sometimes you're like, you know, God, give me wisdom that I can become rich and bless the kingdom of God through this business. If you're a parent in here, God, give me wisdom to help turn my child's life around so that they won't be lost. There's a lot of reasons why we can pray and probably have prayed for wisdom. But why did God grant this great portion of wisdom to this young man? He says, give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind for what? To govern your people, able to discern, discern between good and evil. For who can govern your people? Everybody say your people. 
See, when you understand that the people that God puts you in front of um, is not just your servants, right? Your children, your family, your congregation, it's all God's. And whenever God gives us a great responsibility like that, we need to turn our eyes to heaven and say, God, every time I open my mouth, would you fill it so that I don't mess this up? Because these are your great people. And he asked for great wisdom to govern God's great people, asking for discernment from, to discern good from evil. I want everybody to say that. No, I can't hear you, but I want you to say it in your car. God, give me discernment so that I might know good from evil. See, <laughs> that's really all that government is all about. See, he says, God, if I'm going to govern your people, if I'm going to take over for my father, I'm going to be dealing with issues that are way above my pay grade and my age and my station in life. Right. Spiritually, I don't even know if I'm equipped. So it's going to take great wisdom and I'm going to need to know good from evil, right from wrong. I know uh, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you, listen, a wise and discerning mind. That's what God told Solomon. Now, when we look at Solomon's governance, um, we see several different policies Right, right there in the book of Kings. Um, we see religious freedom policies where he built the temple in just seven years, taking over from his father. We see civil policy where he was dealing with civil disputes. You all remember the two mothers. The one mother had a baby and for some re you know, reason, I think maybe she rolled over on the baby on accident and the baby dies. And what did she do? She went in the night and switched her dead baby with another mother's live baby. Y'all remember this? And then they were arguing back and forth to the king uh, or, or to the leadership, whose baby is whose? Like, this is my baby. And no, this is my baby. So they took the two women and the one child to King Solomon. Right? Probably 20 some years old at the time. And they said, King, the one mother says the baby is hers. The other mother says the baby is hers. What do we do? And Solomon says, uh, you remember the story, take the child. And since I don't know who's telling the truth, we're going to cut that baby in half and give each mother a cut. And the one mother, the true mother, steps up and says, please, sir, please, king, don't do that. Don't kill the child. Give the baby to the woman. Don't kill the child. And that's how the king knew and that's how he knew how to settle this civil dispute over the child. And the scripture says that it was noised abroad, the wisdom of this great king, right? And we all love the story, but that was wisdom God gave him to settle a civic dispute. Then trade policy. It says that one of the great parts about his rule and reign was that he controlled international trade routes. Um, he had trade routes open to the entire world and was doing business and commerce with, with nations all over the world. And then because of that, the economic policy of King Solomon was through the roof. It says he had immeasurable wealth. He had ivory towers laden with gold on top of the ivory. This man's wealth in the kingdom of, of Israel at the time uh, was out of this world. But how many know also that Solomon wasn't just a great and wise leader, he was divinely called, but he was also deeply flawed. Now, wait a minute. How in the world, why would God give this man such great wisdom and, and he's such a flawed individual? Because if God's going to work with any of you, he's going to be working with flawed individuals. <laughs> Amen. And regardless... Regardless of who won the election a few weeks ago, God is going to be working with a flawed, a deeply flawed individual. Amen. And so we have to pray for their wisdom, regardless of who won. And we have to pray for our wisdom, because ultimately, when those jokers come and go, we will still be here to elect the next leaders of our local, state, and federal government, because we are Americans. And that is the privilege that we hold as Americans. So one of his, his flaws was women. 
He, um, he would form all of these pagan alliances. See, to be able to have so many trade routes opening, you had to form alliances. And one of the, the best way that they would form alliances was to marry and, and to swap kids with each other, right? Like, I'll let you marry my daughter, and, and so then we'll have this great alliance. And that had ramifications in the military, ramifications in, um, uh, in commerce and in resources that were being shared. But he had 700 wives. Now think about that. 700 wives and he had 300 concubines. Right now, some of y'all, you're going to have to do the math for me, but that's at least 999 problems. <laughs> right. Because each. OK. All right. I see who's driving this morning. <laughs> that's all the men. Right. That's a thousand women. Each one of them, all of them coming from different places. And listen, all of them bringing all of their foreign gods. And that was a problem for Solomon because with the women came the foreign gods. He built altars and high places for their gods, including Molech. And you know who Molech was. He was the child sacrifice god. Astaroth, the fertility and temple prostitution god, and instead of destroying those temples, he built the high places for those gods. Why? Because they were his wives' gods. And even though we know that we might be the head of the house, she's the neck. And the head don't do nothing without the neck. Amen. Despite his divine wisdom and two encounters with God. See, the first encounter, God gave him wisdom. But the second encounter, God gave him a warning. Amen. And I believe that God still operates that with you know, like that with his leaders and with us today. Solomon chose to turn his devotion away from God and towards pagan women and idol worship. And we read about that in first Kings 11 and 9 and 10. God may choose to gift us with wisdom and he does. But it is up to us to choose how we use that wisdom. God's giftings and calling, callings, according to scripture, are without repentance, which means that they are irrevocable. You might be the most gifted person in Salem. You might be the most you know, called and gifted person in Columbiana County, but you have to choose to use that wisdom and those gifts to honor the Lord. And if you don't, then all of those people that are looking to you as once a wise and spiritual leader now you are leading them astray because you still have the call and you still have the gift because they are revocable. But what is not irrevocable is his presence. What is not irrevocable is the peace that comes with his presence that you can lose and you will if you misuse the calling and the wisdom. And that's where we see the divine call on a leader turn because of a deep flaw of a leader. Are y'all hearing me this morning? The bedrock of any government is some moral standard of good and evil. I think the last time I was here, we talked about four forms of biblical government, church government, civil government, family government, and self-government. But this morning, I wanted to dive a little bit deeper because I don't want you just focusing on Trump for the next four years. You are who God is looking at to turn this country around. You are who God is looking for to grant wisdom to in local and state and even for some of you, federal government. Even if not just but for our vote. In Hebrew 5, 1 through 14, we read about church government. Follow with me, please. Every high priest is appointed from among men to represent them. Everybody say represent them, right? Sounds like government to me. In matters relating to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He's able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and misguided since he himself is beset with weakness. All of us, right? That is why he is obligated to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to explain because you are dull of hearing. Although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to reteach you 
the basic principles of God's word. You need milk, not solid food. Listen, verse 13. For everyone who lives on milk is still an infant inexperienced in the message of righteousness. What is righteousness? God's right standing, his righteous standing. But solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained their senses to distinguish what? Good from evil. So what is important for us as we lead our families, mothers and fathers in church government? Do we have a righteous understanding of God's standard for good and evil? If we don't, it says that we are unfit to govern, even in our family. Let's look at civil government. Amos 5 and 14. Do what is good and run from evil so that you may live. Then the Lord God of heaven's armies will be your helper just as you have claimed. Hate evil and love what is good. Turn your courts into true halls of justice. Perhaps even yet the Lord God of heaven armies will have mercy on the remnant of his people. When will he have mercy on the remnant of his people? When the leaders within civil government rightly divide good and evil. If the leadership can do that, then the people will be blessed. Uh, Romans 13, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, only to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good. And you will have praise from the same, for he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is, a God's, he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on whom practices evil. So what is the role of civil government according to Romans 13? To promote good and to prevent evil. See, listen, guys, I want you, whenever you hear the word government, I don't want you to think about like what, what Representative Tim Ginter used to be, right? What Pastor Tim Ginter used to be. You know, he gets to deal with government. No, no, no. We all have to deal with government and we all have to bring God's standard to bear uh, in society about what is good and what is evil. So whenever you hear government, I want you to hear that, that dichotomy of good and evil. Family government. Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7. These commandments or standards of right and wrong that I give you today are to be on your hearts, impress them on your children. Talk, wait a minute, should, is it the school's responsibility to impress good and evil on your children? It's your responsibility, it's my responsibility to impress them on our children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Proverbs 22 and 6, train up a child in the way they should go. There's a right way and a wrong way. And he should go and do, uh, when he is old, he will not depart from it. And lastly, the fourth government piece here I want to teach about is uh, self-government. And that's where we get the Ten Commandments, right? God's law for self-government, we find in the Ten Commandments, in Exodus 20. The first four laws are about our relationship with God, how we are to relate to God, right? Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Thou shalt not have any idols. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. That's his moral standard of right and wrong in how we are to relate as individuals to himself. And then the last six of the Ten Commandments is his law about how we're supposed to deal with our brothers and sisters. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor and you shall not covet. And every last one of those Ten Commandments we can base our policies on. How should we deal with commerce? How should we deal 
with health care? How should we deal with education and the parent's role in education? All that we find in these self-government laws. Now, real quick, before I start to wrap this up, wicked government policies that were stopped because of Christian. I want to give you a real quick historic perspective of the powerful influence of believers throughout history in dealing with some demonic policies. How many know we got some demonic policies even here in America right now, right? Amen. And uh, hopefully you all will join with us at CCV to help squash some of those policies, at least in the state of Ohio. But I want to give you even some, some, some worse policies. I know many of you have heard about the gladiators. There's a new movie coming out. It's, uh, it's about gladiators and, and things like that. And a lot of us understand who they were and that they existed and that it was brutal. I mean, you literally had human beings ripping other human beings apart limb from limb. Um, there was one, one account of 10,000 gladiators over the course of 120 some days ripping each other apart throughout the city. The gladiator games were so popular, the, um, the elite of the day would, would, would get like 30 gladiators together for a kids, their kids' uh, birthday parties. And their kids would sit and watch this, this massacre take place in front of them. This was not just gladiator games, but these were public policies. These public policies dealt with criminal justice. These policies dealt with um, prisoner of war laws, right? Because who were the gladiators? These were guys who they considered criminals. Now, on that day, anybody could be considered a criminal, but that's how they punished criminals, and that's how they dealt with prisoners of war. These were public policies that were evil. And thankfully, Emperor um, Honorius, who was a Christian, ultimately got rid of the gladiator games and the gladiator schools five years later. That was a believer. The reason why we don't have gladiator games today was because of a Christian emperor back then. Another one is um, child welfare laws. Um, anybody ever heard of infant exposure? This was crazy. Um, if you were poor, if a woman was pregnant um, and maybe the, the family was poor, uh, maybe it was an illegitimate child, maybe she just didn't want the baby, what they would do is just take the baby and just leave the baby aside. Just drop it on the street. And then um, horses would come down the street and trample the baby, and that's what they called ex infant exposure. There was many ways that they did it, but it really was just leaving the child somewhere behind a, a, you know, a big basket or something like that and, you know, a barrel. And uh, they would expose the child to the elements until it died. And it was reasonably, you know, mainly because of convenience or because the baby was a female. See, females weren't looked upon very, um, you know, positively in that day. And so if a child was born and it was a female instead of a male, then they would, they would apply this policy. It was in law that this was legal. You could just expose the girl, the little baby. I want to explain to you how deeply rooted and common this practice was. This is a letter from a husband to his wife, Hilarion to Alice, his wife, heartiest greetings. Know that we are still even now in Alexandria. Do not worry if when all others return, I remain in Alexandria. I beg and beseech you, take care of the little child. Everybody say, oh, you know, take care of the children. And as soon as we receive wages, I will send them to you. If good luck to you, you have a child. If it is a boy, let it live. If it is a girl, throw it out. You told Aphrodite to tell me, don't forget me. How can I forget you? I beg you, therefore, don't worry. Love, Hilarion. That's how common it was. If you get pregnant, girl, that's cool. But if it's a boy, let it live. If it's a girl, just throw it away. Love you. How could I ever forget you? Listen, we might look at that time and that age. How could you do such a thing? And the answer is, you can do such a thing when your heart grows cold.
cold because we lose sight of the standard of God for good and evil. When culture becomes the standard instead of this book, this is what it produces in culture. Therefore, that's what produces the policies that govern our world. Until a believer comes along named Emperor Valentinian in A.D. 374. Emperor Valentinian came in who was a believer and he said enough is enough. We're stopping this policy. Listen, and this is what is going to be from now on. And the last one is religious freedom. There was a, an error in history um, with, uh, with the Diocletian in uh, A.D. 285. And, and basically that was one of the worst times for the Christian church uh, in that day. And they would go from house to house, setting houses on fire. You know, Christian families were perished. They would link entire Christian families together by the neck and march them off of cliffs. Um, it was a game almost that they were playing um, until Emperor Constantine comes along. And before I did this study, I thought Constantine was the, 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 the emperor that said, wait a minute, everybody in, in, uh, in, in the whole nation has to be Christian. And that wasn't him. What he said was, you don't have to be Christian, but it's also not illegal to be a Christian. <laughs> right? That's what Emperor Constantine did. And the beauty of him was that he wasn't even a Christian when he first became an emperor. He was converted about halfway into his reign. And there was a man that um, I was reading and, 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 and got to kind of know before he passed. Uh, his name was Tom Minery. And, and as I think about Emperor Constantine and how God changed his heart and because God changed the heart of one man who was powerful, that one man changed how Christians lived from that time on until today. Because of one man's changed heart. This is what Tom Minery said. He was a good friend of uh, uh, of some of the folks that, that you would know, but, but you would probably never know Tom Minery. He said, when hearts are changed by the gospel, they begin to beat in new rhythms. He was Billy Graham's best friend. Being renewed in Christ, they begin to see with fresh eyes what is wrong. Because the gospel has taught them what is right. They are the ones who cannot ignore what is happening around them uh, they are the ones who stand up and say somebody has to do something. See, if every changed heart out here under this carport or under the sound of my voice in that church, if your heart has been converted by the power of the almighty God, then you ought to see a different way than everybody else. You Things that you thought were OK or no big deal, you ought to see as a problem now. And things that they would tell you is politically incorrect and you can't talk about. You need to see that as a problem now and be outspoken to lift up your voice and speak righteousness, even in the midst of lies and liars. This is what a converted heart compels us to do. It helps us and causes us and compels us to govern our Jerusalem well, whether that Jerusalem is your home or the Jerusalem is your job or young people, the Jerusalem is your sports team, govern well. Help the people around you discern good from evil according not to your standard or your culture standard or your church's standard, but to the Bible, God's holy standard. Anything less. Anything less is wicked leadership, wicked leadership, whether it's it's uh, it's uh, Biden, whether it's uh, Trump or Sherrod Brown or, you know, whoever you voted for or didn't vote for. Listen, wicked leadership is wicked leadership and it's based on the standard of this book, not a political party. That's why Christians have to stay engaged. And I want to land a plane back here in the U.S. with the Declaration and the Constitution. 
The Declaration says we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the creator with certain and alienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But listen here. But all that is useless without this point right here. But to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That's what makes us unique in America. That's why we have to take those righteous standards beyond our homes and our personal prayer lives and into society because we are the government and the governed in this country. And if there's going to be righteousness that reigns in America, it's going to be because of the standard set by the righteous in America. But yet 40% of Christians don't vote. So when we see the world becoming a hot mess, don't blame it on the Democrats, Republicans. Don't, don't blame it on the Republicans, Democrats. Blame it on the church who was given a gift and like Solomon chose not to use it responsibly. Don't hide your gift under a bushel family. If we're gonna see this nation turn around, it's not because of the next 4,000 picks of Trump in the next 100 and some days. It's because of those who pray for righteous leadership and who urge their leaders, local all the way up to federal, to govern righteously, discerning good from evil. The Constitution, <laughs> exiting the Constitutional Convention, um, Ben Franklin was leading, leaving that building after they had just signed their names to the Constitution. And somebody stopped Ben and said, well, doctor, what have we got, a republic or a monarchy? Do we have a king or are the people, the governed, are we, are we the government, are the people the government, a republic? And he said, the democratic republics are not merely, he said, we have a republic if you can keep it, because democratic republics are not merely founded upon the consent of the people, they are also absolutely dependent upon the active and informed involvement of the people for their continued good health. It is irresponsible to be in a country as great as this. I don't know if you know this, and this is kind of scary. There's only been 27 world powers like America, and America is the 27th. They all die eventually. All these world powers, they, you know, Russia, China, you know, the UK, right, Germany, they all die. And the way they die is not because of murder, but suicide. They die from within. But the thing about America being the 27th world power, and they only last about 200 to 250 years. So what does that say about America right now? Historically, we are an anomaly. Not just because we're 250 some years old, we're an anomaly because a lot of the longest lasting world powers were long lasting because they were monarchies. They, had, they could control the people. But America said, no, 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 the people will control themselves. And usually that doesn't last too long because we and you are hot messes, <laughs> right? But somehow this great republic has stood. And the question is why? And we find that in a quote from John Adams who said, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Morality and virtue are the foundation of our republic and necessary for a society to remain free. But what if 40% of those righteous religious people buy the lie that we need not engage in government? Then what happens? Decay and national suicide. And we sit behind our televisions and our screens and whine about the degradation of our country 
Meanwhile, we do nothing to engage it. Listen, this is dangerous. We are at a pivotal point in our nation, 250 years. Will we succeed to be the longest government, standing government in the world? Who knows? It depends on what the body of Christ does with the standard of good and evil. And hopefully you all are hearing me when I say that. King Solomon, I would just repeat one more time. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to one govern your people, able to discern good and evil evil. The next time you hear somebody say you can't legislate morality, I want you to slap them in the mouth spiritually. <laughs> slap them in the mouth with a prayer. That's the dumbest thing you could possibly say. And I want you to think about it. Name one law that is not a moral law. Name one law, one rule that is not based on somebody's moral code of right and wrong. The reason why you voted for who you voted for as president is because you agreed more with their standard of right and wrong than the other one. And that applies to whether you're a Democrat or a Republican alike, right? Which standard of right and wrong do I most agree with? That is morality and you legislated morality when you voted. <laughs> we all do. So family, here's my prayer for us today. It's found in Romans 2 and 2. And I want to read this in a different context, maybe than what you've heard it. I want to pray for divine wisdom, not just for Trump and J.D. Vance. I want to pray for wisdom for us to govern divinely. I want to pray for wisdom for us to lead on a local, state, and federal level. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but instead be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Listen, that by testing, you may discern, here we go again, what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Father, I thank you for this time with this great church. I thank you for these that have gathered to hear your word. And uh, Lord, I pray, even with this broken vessel, Lord, that somehow your word and your wisdom um, and your principles were carried forth to this great congregation, your people. Father, grant us wisdom to govern well. Father, even with our flaws, even with our shortcomings and our sins, Lord, it is your people that is at stake. Many of us have children. Many of us have businesses. Many of us have important jobs, things that we need to do to serve others, your people well. And Lord, I pray that you would grant us conviction of spirit, that when we go off course, Lord, that we would repent quickly like King David and not just let that thing drawn on and destroy a kingdom and destroy a, 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 our, our leadership like his son Solomon. Lord, we pray, Father, that you would grant us the wisdom to govern well in church government, family government, Lord, civil government, and most importantly, self-government. Lord, not that we would be glorified by the wisdom, not that we would become rich because of the wisdom or even gain long life, but that your people would be blessed and that you would be glorified through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Family, thank you so much for your time. Once again, this has been a blessing. Thank you.